Episode 123, so that's like one, two, three, so maybe that's like lucky somewhere, like maybe that's like a lucky number in China or something. Episode 123, Speed Metal Cycling Podcast, I am your host, Dan Skullcrusher, it is uh, the end of March, the beginning of April 2016, and April is a month that contains my birthday, so it's a very special month. It also contains uh, Hitler's birthday. Joining me today uh, to discuss many a thing cycling is my dear brother, Klaus. Klaus, how are you doing, sir? I'm here and Mike is not. That's all I need to say. Exactly. So you're most definitely better than Mike. Yeah. Mike is not here today because he's actually traveling. On a date again. He's on a date. No, actually, you know what he's doing? He actually went to see Batman versus Superman or Superman versus Batman this morning, and he's still there because that's how long the movie is. Oh. He's in Team Superman? He's. Uh, actually, I wonder if. I think Mike is Team Superman over Team Batman. I know that he likes old DC comic books, but uh, yeah, he seems like way more of a Superman guy. But the Superman from the movie, I'm sure, is not the Superman that he loves. I'm. I'm sure it isn't, but, well, whichever. I don't know. I actually went to see the, mor- the, the movie this morning, and I encourage everybody to go and see it. You read the reviews, and it just got shit on really badly on reviews. And the fact is that the, the movie is not really that bad. The biggest problem with the movie is that it's two and a half hours long, and it should not be. You could cut out a good 30 minutes or 45 minutes out of the movie easily. They just try to cram way too much into it. But... You should go but Richard Pryor is in it, right? What's that? Richard Pryor is still in it, right? <laughs> no, no, Richard Pryor has been uh, replaced. What? They cut him out? Yeah, by that dude that played the Facebook guy. What's his name? The guy. Oh, that... yeah, yeah, yeah. The the poor man's Michael Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> now, Michael Sarah makes crappy movies, and the poor man's Michael Sarah is making like. I mean, the movie grossed almost half a billion dollars over the weekend, so it's a pretty big deal. And Richard Pryor is going to get oh, no, none of that. None of that. Richard Pryor is getting zilcho. Yeah. <laughs> I'd completely forgotten that uh, Richard Pryor was in that Superman movie. That's uh, all I remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think those movies, I mean, they seemed fun to me, but I was a little kid then, so I didn't know anybody. No, I, I, I think that the first two are pretty good. Um Whichever one it was where the guy, like, starts controlling the sun or whatever, and he has, like, little sun fingers or something. I don't know. Whatever. Right? Anyway, let's talk about cycling, shall we? Um, yes. If, if, you, if you want, Klaus. It's not really. Yeah, no, no. I'm just <laughs> I'm amazed that when Mike is not here, we get to it far quicker. So that's that's good. Mike, that, if you're listening, we're inefficient because of you. You are to blame. He Absolutely. But when you're not here... Mike and I actually do a whole podcast, one-hour podcast, talking about the problems with the New York City subway system. Damn, I knew it. I, it's, it's crazy. Um, hey, when, when you're not in the podcast, right, and we have, like, Mike and a guest or something or whatever, mm-hmm. um, do you usually listen to the episode or do you just like, yeah, fuck it? I've listened to a couple. I know I've listened uh, to a couple of, like, Nate King ones where Nate plays the part of Klaus. Oh. <laughs> Where I'm like, I want to introduce my brother Klaus, and he's like, "Hello, better than Mike." <laughs> that sounds yeah. Like- so you you don't want to miss those comedic nuggets <laughs> that Nate serves up. Oh man, my other computer is like not working right now. But oh, okay. So oh. did we discuss Milan San Remo? 
No, I think we were saying who our favorites were. Oh, yeah, that's right. We had yeah. said, uh, Mike had said uh, Ulisi. And, oh, no, no, that was the, the head. Both of you guys said Cancellara. Nate said yes. Cancellara. And I said Alexander Kristoff. Shows how much we know. Well, that was a crazy Milan San Remo finish. I mean, I think Cancellara wouldn't have won because it was a sprint. But Ga- clearly Gaviria could have. I think Sagan could have. If Gaviria think- wouldn't have, like, basically taken him out of the equation. Yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, Cancellara was taken out of the equation, too. So. Yeah, but, again, I mean, if I – if it's a sprint – I mean, it was kind of still pretty far out. But if I tell you the sprint is Buhani, Sagan, Gaviria, and Cancellara. And then, yeah, and then a couple of other randoms. No, 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 absolutely. I, I, I agree with you, and I, I think that... And it's not even because, obviously, both of us are definitely uh, jaded in our opinion because we both wanted Gaviria to win so badly. But I really... If you look at, if you look at who, who was in that group... Um, yeah, I, I think I think it would definitely would have been uh, it, it was it was Gaviria's sprint to lose. Um, yeah, it's it's it was really it, it, this, you're right to, though too the 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 race developed weird and 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 it's not definitely not the usual Milan San Remo, which then begs the next question, which you and I kind of discussed a little bit was is. Gaviria gets this opportunity because of this kind of weird Milan San Remo. Will he ever get an opportunity like this again? Do we believe that he's going to eventually develop to be the, the cyclist that will put himself in that situation again? Or will he need for all the stars to align just so once again for him to be able to appear in that way in another Milan San Remo? with 500 meters to go or whatever. See, I think he will develop into the kind of cyclist that can get himself and put himself into great situations. But Milan San Remo is just unforgiving, and you just don't know. I think I mentioned this before. People like Freddy Rodriguez, like Heinrich Hausler, I mean, my God, like Mark Cavendish, will, I mean, will Simon Garans win it again, even if he has a really strong year? <laughs> Probably you just not. you don't know. That's the thing. The race has to play out uh, in a weird way. I certainly hope so, and I do think he's going to be a super strong sprinter. But that race is just unforgiving. It was um, it was a fun race to watch, though. I'll tell you that. I I, uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit. It, it was a little, not a little. It was very, very, very disappointing at the end. I was very disappointed, um, almost angry, and it's it's interesting that if I compare that to like for example the Volta Catalunya with Quintana winning it, I'm not as excited about Quintana winning anymore as I used to be. Now I'm just like, oh, Quintana won, all right. Although, if he won the tour. That would be huge. Uh, yeah, I th- yeah, yeah, you're right. But then again, the Vuelta Catalunya versus San Remo. Well, yeah, yes, you're, right. you're absolutely it's right. It's no comparison. But... Even though the Vuelta Catalunya, for the length and time of the year that the race is, it's awesome. Yeah, but it's not Milan San Remo, of course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But Quintana's win was very cool. It's just one of those races that you're like, when exactly did he win it? <laughs> <laughs> And, of course, it's not because he won a stage. It was that one stage where he came ahead of other people but was, like, third or it's, something. People all right. So, yeah. So, I mean, so, you know, Arnold de Mar won it, which I, I think it's good in general. Uh, for one, is a Frenchman, which is, like, let's throw a little bone that way because these guys have been, like, suffering for so long. But was it a French car that helped him? Was it a Renault? It was, <laughs> I think it was a Peugeot that helped him, so. Maybe, but it could have been a German car. Yeah. What if it was a Volkswagen? We don't know. I still think that uh, <laughs> I, it, it was probably a French car. I don't think that a French rider would be helped. I, I, don't, I don't think a German car would probably be a look, look at a French rider and be like, nah. Yeah, <laughs> but, I don't know. So, no, it's good. It's good for the team. 
It's very good that Mark Madio didn't die of a heart attack, or at least not that I've heard. There hasn't been a death reported yet. Which he almost always is very close to doing. Well, yeah, exactly. So I thought, I mean, an FDJ rider won a big race. This guy is going to die of a heart attack, and he didn't, so I'm very happy. Uh, ben Swift was second, of course. Jurgen Rollins was third. Then Buhani, Van Avermaet, uh, Christoph, Henrik Hausler, Pippo Pozzato, and Sonny Colebri, Col- Colebrelli. Was that that was your? Uh, oh no, uh, Matteo Trentin was was your top ten. It, it if you look at Gaviria, I think yeah, a straight a straight uh, sprint would probably have been Buhani, Gaviria, maybe Kristoff. Other than yeah. that, Henrik Hausler would have come in in seventh, no matter what. <laughs> People Posato would not have been. Uh, it, it was. I mean, possibly after such a long day, he wouldn't. It's possible. We don't know that he wouldn't have won for sure, but it's it certainly looked good that he made it that far. Yes. On what was easily the longest race in his life. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So it made it really interesting. It made it awesome. And I also yelled and screamed quite a bit, actually. Uh, at the screen, like I hadn't in a in a long, long time. So then, that actually brings us up to Dwarf's Dorf Landren, because there he also made it all the way up to the end in the group and launched the sprint, and then just totally ran out of gas. And yeah, he, he went got, way too early. He either just... either he went too early. I don't know. I, I don't think he went too early because I saw the replay. He goes, and he just doesn't last very long. I think he thought he had it in his legs. So it's not like he went like 500 meters when he thought it was 250 meters. He went where he thought he should have gone, and yeah. he, I, I, which I guess kind of sort of means he went too early. But I don't think he went too early thinking, um, I'm going to win this room out here. Watch me. I think he thought... Oh, okay, this is. I should go now, and he just his legs just totally did not respond. He accelerated. He was like four or five pedal strikes, and then he was done. Which is a good lesson for him to learn, because uh, well, for obvious reasons, but in part because that's how he has won a lot of things so far. I mean, a lot. He hasn't won that many, but you know, um, he has gone very early and has been able to just keep going and not fading. So. I guess this will teach him, you know, those kinds of subtleties that riders probably uh, pick up on over time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's he's such a young kid that uh, all, all these things, while I look at him, I'm like, God damn it, why didn't he win? I'm like, this guy's going to do this race 12 more times. I, uh, I should be, I should be, I should calm down and, and take it easy. And just so that everybody doesn't say that this is the Fernando Gaviria podcast, uh, Jens de Boucheret uh, won um, the Doors from Flandern. Brian Cocard was second. Edward, and this guy's last name I've never been able to pronounce right. And it's the reason that I want to know somebody that knows how to speak French. I think it's, it's pronounced Tunes. Teuns, T H E U N S. Pippo Pozzato was fourth. Croquelier. Another tough one. Keukelier was uh, fifth. Yeah, Nizzolo, sixth. Oscar Gato, man. My boy. Uh, was seventh. Um, that British dude whose name I can't pronounce either was eighth and the Ooh. other whoa you know what mm. one two three four five six out of the top ten I can't pronounce that's, <laughs> that's awesome and number ten is uh, Fernando Gaviria so there you go that was that was Duarte Dorf Landren a race that I enjoy very much in general it's uh, usually it's in a straightforward sprints from a smaller group but uh but it's a fun race and i think the reason that i started to like this race so much i don't think the the actual reason why is because they all remind me of the tour of flanders and i know the tour of flanders is coming so i just totally love that about them and they have that kind of i mean obviously because they're in the same freaking place but i mean they you know it's just there's there's something about 
that, that racing that happens in which is what made the yesterday stage of the three days of the panda so good. interesting because it was the Muir. Absolutely. Even though it didn't really ended up not having anything to do with anything, but no. But just seeing that and seeing kind of the crane shot that shows the church and stuff is awesome. Since the Tour of Flanders can't be bothered yeah, with going there, they're too good. The Tour of Flanders is too good to uh, go through the Muir again. Yeah. Uh, speaking of churches and sacred and whatever, did you see the poster for the E3 Harold Becker for this year? No. Oh, my God. You have to just do a search for E3 Harold Becker 2016, and I'm sure the poster will come up. It's like a priest, like, giving, like, a like a oh, sermon. Yeah. Like, a priest giving a sermon, and the priest has a halo, and the halo is a bicycle wheel. And it says, cycling is holy, winning is sacred. This race is named after a highway that doesn't exist anymore. (laughs) That is interesting. Whoever does the E3 posters, remember, they're the ones that had, in 2015, they had the girl's skirt lifting and the cyclist's hand with gloves about to grab her butt. They also had one that was a bike made out of women. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. They're clearly, like, you know, interested in doing different stuff, but sometimes they do a good job, sometimes <laughs> not as much. So this year, I think, is very good. This race was amazingly awesome. I loved everything about it. Mikhail Kiotowski came in first, Peter Sagan second, Ian Stannard, Cancellara fourth, Jasper Steven fifth, Lars Baum sixth, Benot, who I'm like growing to absolutely love, was sixth, uh, seventh, I'm sorry, Seb Van Mark, another one of my favorites, was eighth, uh, Drucker was ninth, uh, Daniel Oz was tenth, and Daniel Oz is another dude that I know he likes metal and stuff, but he has like long hair now too, which is like just so awesome. By the way, uh, uh, what's his name? Jasper? Steven. Steven. He, and I point this out with no comment. Interesting that he wears a Livestrong bracelet. Yes, that's right. You pointed that out. Yeah. He raced for the Livestrong team, but it's still, it's pretty funny to see. Yeah. I thought I was the only person that still wore one. I know. Oh. You have company. Yeah, yeah apparently. Yeah. Winning company. I w- yes, absolutely winning company. I don't wear that. I never wore one. I think it's completely fucking retarded. But I th- you wear I, one now. Yeah, no, actually, I should start wearing one now. Like, what? I'm a cycling fan. It's like how both you and I own rock racing kit, and we wear it now. Unironically, yes. every Honor. day. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's awesome. It's like I went to see Batman vs. Superman completely unironically. By That's myself. Exactly. By myself today. You know how yeah. scared I was about how long the movie was going to be? I actually went to pee right before I went to the movie. I made sure that I didn't drink a lot before the movie started and, and before I went to the movie. And then I peed as soon as I got to the theater. I went and sat down. And even with that, the last half hour of the movie, I was like, oh, God, I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. But I held it. I've never had a problem with that except for this last Star Wars. I've never gone to the bathroom during a movie. Ever, 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 ever. But I really thought I was going to die if I didn't, <laughs> which I think just says that I'm getting old and I can't control my bladder all that well. I think that that's what's happening with me as well. I think that I'm getting a little bit older. And uh, yeah, so uh, Michal Kiatowski, do, do, do you think that that's a good, I mean, I know he deserved the win. Absolutely. I'm just saying, are you happy with that or, or not? How do you feel about Kiatowski? I think it's good. I mean, I think, uh, no, I like him, especially because, I mean, as world champion, he didn't have like a, I mean, he won a monument, if I remember correctly. What what did he want? Something. But um, I don't know. I still like the guy. I used to like him a lot when he was young and whatever. And then he won the world championship and I just didn't like him anymore. I don't know why. I just like, I just didn't like him. It wasn't, then, <laughs> it wasn't as much fun to like a world. Yeah, player. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Yeah, may, maybe that's it. Maybe, you know. That's how it is with Sagan. You and I loved him, and now we don't like him. Yeah, I don't like him. No, you know, um, I had a friend that I used to work with. Uh, like, he knew me really, really well. I share an office with him for years. 
And he told me once, you know, he was like, oh, you know, Dan, the thing is that you're just a contrarian. Whatever most people like, you hate. And I was like, dude, that's not true. That's just bullshit. But he told me that, like, let's say a year into our, like, cohabiting. I don't know if that's a word, but... Cohabitationing. Cohabitationing. And then maybe 20 times after that, throughout the years... Every once in a while, he'll be like, see what I mean? Everybody likes A, so you say you hate A. I'm like, no, but that's not why. I have come to the conclusion that I do hate a lot of things that other people like because most other people are fucking idiots. That's really the conclusion <laughs> that I'm... Anyway, I, I didn't like Kiatowski while he was... So you're a contrarian and a misanthrope. <laughs> I'm not a contrarian. I'm, I'm amazing. I am awesome. And people are stupid. See, his argument was, people liked A, therefore, you hate A. No, 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 no. What happens is, I hate A, therefore, people like A. No, I say, everyone likes A, so therefore, you like B. Yeah, I mean, which is... Kind of a contrarian, but it's like a a second tier. A (laughs) second... Yeah. Yeah, I mean... But I don't... No one likes Kwiatowski. I mean, it's... it's not like he has a huge following. I'm sure in Poland. Aside from in Poland, yeah, of course. But I'm sure his family likes him a lot. No, 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 no. So, but here's the thing. So I stopped. I stopped liking him. It's not that I hated him. I mean, he wasn't like at the Peter Sagan like level or anything, but or Chris Froome level or anything. But I just didn't like him. But I didn't know why. I couldn't like. Oh, I'm not really sure why. And then at the beginning of the season, I saw him wearing the sky kit with like the rainbow stripes, and I was like, "Oh my god, Katowski, There he is. He's back." It's like he left me, but then came back. You know what I mean? Like like a band that puts out a horrible record, but then their Makes next record is awesome. You know what I mean? And then when you like go see them live, when he put out the funky Headhunter. Yeah. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but then, but then when they go out and tour for that new awesome album, they don't play any of the songs from the terrible record. Like Iron Maiden, who refused to acknowledge the fact that they had another guy singing for one album and never play that stuff. Uh, two albums, and both albums are really good. Two albums, but they don't play that stuff. They do not play that stuff. Well, actually, that's not true. Uh, they, if they tour as Iron Maiden supporting their new record, which they do as well as doing their retro shows, then they might play Lord of the Flies, which is which was their big like song out of those. Okay, two. so I guess there is one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and I, I've only seen them do that song once. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't happen very often. So basically, what we're saying is, Michal Kwiatkowski is almost like Iron Maiden. Pretty but, much. But from Poland. Other than yeah. the Polish thing, they're basically the same thing. He's the Polish Iron Maiden, so he's Vader. <laughs> he's... <laughs> if anyone knows who Vader is, they don't sound like Iron Maiden. It's just the only Polish band I could think of. <laughs> Are Vader from Poland? I'm pretty sure, yeah. Oh, let's see. Vader band. Everybody should go out and look up uh, Vader. Uh, yes, they are. They're from... Olsten. Olsten. There you go. Formed in 1983. My goodness, they've been around. And they definitely do not sound anything like Iron Maiden. All right. So uh, so we have the E3 Harold Becker, which, like I said, I enjoyed very much. I like this race a lot, too. And I was definitely, definitely uh, rooting for Cancellara to win this. I really wanted him to... I want him to win as much as he can in this last year of his of his career. I I think he deserves it, and and then it became really really apparent to me that what I had to do was actually as that group of like whatever it was like ten or twelve dudes uh, kept going. I it became very apparent that what I had to do was to actually start rooting against Sagan. <laughs> it's what really needed to happen. I didn't care at that point who won. <laughs> I just well, You don't even have to because Sagan is always going to almost always going to just be second anyway. Almost always. Um so so I was very happy that Katowski won for two reasons because his name is not Sagan and 
because it's Mika uh, Kiatowski, and, and I like it. I, I like him a lot, and so I like him. More. Now you like him. I like him again. I like him again this year. I now like that him. no one remembers who he is. Exactly. So maybe it is like the Metallica fan that hated Metallica when they became popular. Maybe that is But what now I'm... you realize that there was great songs in the Black Album. No, I still like. I, I still think that there's some good songs in the Black Album. Oh no! No, I was listening to it actually maybe about a month ago, and my wife walked in. She was like, "You're listening to Metallica?" Like she said it with such disdain. <laughs> I was like almost embarrassed. No, but not Metallica. It's that album. I know. That's I know. Thing. I know. I know. I, whatever. It, whatever. Sad but true, man. Oof! The God that failed. Oh, oh mom. <laughs> I, I like that record, actually. I do. I do. I'm sorry. I mean, as, 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 a, as a novelty. It's not a record that I will play over and over and over and over again. Oh, something else. While we're speaking about metal, and it's funny that we're talking a lot about metal, of course, because Mike is not around and he's a mm. hater. Uh, the new uh, Slayer video came out on YouTube. It's on their YouTube uh, thing. And it's basically a prequel to their other video with the prison riot, where the riot goes nuts in prison. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a prequel. It shows how the guy got to prison. It's kind oh, of is, is uh, Machete in there? What's no, his name? no. <laughs> no, he Danny. was already in jail when this guy got to jail. No, I was expecting a Danny Trejo, like, little thing in there, but no, there was no... Yeah, I see it. I'll have to check it out. Hey, do you want to hear something else that is completely random and absolutely has nothing to do with anything, but I just thought... Please. From brother to brother, but then everybody's listening. Okay, so I told you that that dude from, okay, that TV show, um, Silicon Valley. Yes. The, the red-headed guy with the curly hair. Yeah. All right, so he's a bartender in Deadpool. He's like a pretty major character in the movie. You know what else he does? You know no. that those uh, those Musinex commercials where there's like a that big like yeah they're like, flam, a like <laughs> whatever yeah he's the voice of one of them oh yes Musinex guy damn yeah that dude's funny he was in a movie called she's out of your league and oh I've seen that movie now. yeah he's in that yeah 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 he's like the friend oh. and. I saw him do stand-up once, like, unannounced, and he's super, super, super funny. Get out! Yeah. Yeah, you don't remember his name? That's how funny he is? Yeah, I don't know. I, I refer to him as the character name in Silicon Valley, or like Bachman. I remember uh, that. His name is T.J. Miller. T.J. Miller. Miller. T.J. Hooker. There you go. T.J. Hooker. T.J. Miller. Yeah. He's, uh, he's really good in Deadpool. Actually, I Deadpool is like the best movie that I've seen in the last 10 years. So everything about that movie is awesome, but he's great in it. He's really, really funny. He has a lot of very good, like, good one-liners, and he's just, he's funny. Anyway, E3, Harold Becker. My um, campaign to never see Peter Sagan win again came to an end abruptly, very shortly after, after that. Yeah, your dreams were crushed. Van Vevelgem. Uh, Peter Sagan won Van Vevelgem. That was uh, Sunday. Uh, Seth Van Mark was second. Kuznetsov was third. Fabian Cancellara was fourth. Arno De Mar fifth. Gaviria sixth. Jurgen Rollins seventh. Uh, Guarnieri was eighth. And Greg Van Avermaet was ninth. And then Michael Morkov was 10th. Why do people always say like top three, top five, or top 10? Here in this podcast, we're going to do top seven from now on. Why do we have to read the top 10? What's the difference between Van Avermaet coming in? Like, it's I mean, a nice round number. Plus, how but, deep do the points go? That's the other thing. UCI points. And that's no, but listen, not that's listen. Nice yeah. round number. How, how is five a nice round number? It isn't a fi- nice round number. And if well, it is because it's, it's, well, it's half of 10, then what about three? If three is a nice That's round the number, someone thought the podium should be three. Like there's three medals. I, I think that well, I think that when they first started the Olympics, they only knew there was three medals: gold, bronze, and silver. They didn't know about aluminum. They didn't know about magnesium. They didn't know. See, about but we're just stuck with that. But yeah, I do think it's important because I, although I don't know how deep the points uh, UCI points go, but 
it's good to point out that as long as Gaviria is around, if he keeps going as he's going now, Colombia will have a very strong team at Worlds because he's getting points where Colombia never got points before. So just with Nairo Quintana and stuff, Colombia was already getting a lot of points. And Gaviria on this side. Yeah, but now, like, he's getting points at Ghent Wevelgem. So pretty much for sure they'll have a full team again. Uh, and speaking of that, you know, Colombia is qualified to the Olympics for the first time since the 92 Olympics in Barcelona. They, they beat the U.S. in Dallas yesterday. Oh, for a second, I thought you were talking about cycling. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. To the, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. To the Olympics for soccer. <laughs> I was like, wait, what happened when Rigoberto Oran was there? He snuck in? No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Colombia, of course, uh, beat Ecuador and um, beat the, 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 they were undefeated. Ecuador was undefeated. They were actually first in the group. Colombia beat sure. them. And then they actually beat Bolivia as well. And since we recorded last time, so Colombia is crawling up slowly, unfortunately, crawling up the back up the table in the uh, qualifiers for the World Cup in South America. So there and if go. Gaviria played for them, then it would be even better. Well, there is a Gaviria that plays with them, but it's not the same Gaviria. It's just same another dude know. whose last name is Gaviria. Yeah. Well, anyway, whichever way, this race, of course, broke my heart. So. There's this Russian dude who's, like, happier than a pig in shit to be surrounded by Seb Van Mark, Peter Sagan, and Fabian Cancellara, right? He's, like, I mean, I'm not going to say he's a nobody, but I don't know anything about him. Like, I really don't. Let me see. He, um, yeah, he's a nobody. <laughs> I just looked him up. So, it, it plus, on top of that, he's actually, he's been in the breakaway the whole time, so he's dead. This awesome train of awesomeness catches him and he's like all right there's absolutely nothing i can do here there's i mean these three guys are way way above my category on top on a on a regular day on even on an even basis here i've been out in the break there's just no way i'm gonna be able to do anything and then at some point somebody could tell him like hey dude you're gonna get a podium spot he'd be like get out of here yeah Podium spot. Unbelievable. However, which I think is awesome. I think it's amazing. But the only thing is that the first guy and the fourth guy should switch places. It should have been Cancellara, Van Mark, Russian guy, Sagan. That's my only problem with the situation. Wait, say that again. Cancellara, Van Mark, Sagan, and then? No, Russian guy, and then Sagan. Oh, okay. Kuznetsov. You know what I mean? Like, I just, I, okay, well, I think that would have been better for me because I, I dislike Peter Sagan very much, and I was very upset that he won, and, you know, we had a breakfast here in the house again with pancakes this time around. My wife made pancakes, and everybody was here, whatever, and I was watching, and nobody was paying attention to the race except for me, and then the race ended, and I just shut the laptop, turned the TV off, and just headed back to where the people were. And they were like, is the, is the cycling over? Is the racing over? Who won? And I was like, um, no, it's, it's not. I it wasn't. Um, let's just not talk about that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then somebody on Twitter was like, why do you hate Sagan so much? And I'm like, I've gone over it so many times on the podcast. But I can tell you this. Cycling needs... A villain. And he's the villain. That's it. Do you hate Lex Luthor? Why? He's Why? not quite a villain, like a truly bad guy in the way that most people, you know what I mean? Listen, like, listen. He's not like a, He grabbed like, a girl's sorry. butt without consent. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That. But po- I think Podium girl is like, oh, he was being silly. Totally underplaying the reality of yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. But beyond that. Oh, I but that's right. That. He talked about, he, t- he did talk about the refugees. <laughs> I hate that. That's the worst thing. And the but thing, though, too, is that I might kind actually. kind of did, but no one is sure. I think that, that listen, kind of let's say that he did. Maybe my situation with Peter Sagan is that I hate people that like him way more than I hate him. That was definitely the case with Lance Armstrong 
from day one since before. See, so that is being kind of being contrarian. No, 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 no. I have a problem with people that are just blind and that are like, oh, he's my favorite. He's the best. He's awesome. He's great. Why? Because he's great and he's awesome and he's amazing and he's just awesome and he's great. And I'm like, you're not really even a cycling fan. You don't really understand what, well, he's amazing and he's awesome and he's great. Okay, really? Why is he great? Well, because he wins a lot. But I think you have to be understanding that not everyone understands or enjoys something at the level and in the way that you do. Granted, but people that do still are like, well, you know, he did talk about the the, the refugee crisis. Oh, oh, yeah, that's right. Like that one time that um, Adolf Hitler uh, actually recycled a plastic bottle. So, I mean, he he's not really that bad. I mean, it's fucking ridiculous. I, the dude... I, I don't detest the guy. I just think he's a, a little douchey or whatever. But I also have now heard from two very, very, very reliable sources of something. I'm going to be so vague here. Of something he does at a certain race that is kind of messed up. It is not illegal. It is not. I'm not talking about oh, doping. Nothing like that. It's nothing. not. It's not illegal where he does it. No, 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 no. It's not performance and nothing. Nothing like that. No, 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 no. I know that it's not like illegal UCI illegal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I so think what, I know what you're just, talking about. It's yeah. something that you just go, oh man. Yeah, whatever. So that just adds to it, and I'm sorry to be so vague, but whatever. You weren't being vague. You were being cryptic. And if somebody out there caught it, then they'll know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. I knew I knew exactly what you were talking about, but that's also actually because you probably told me before. But anyway, whichever way, let's move on. Is he talented, though? Absolutely. fucking lutely Does he deserve oh. all the wins that he's gotten? Without a doubt. If you go back and listen to this podcast no, no, three years ago, four years ago, when he first became pro and nobody even knew who he was, who was singing his praise? This guy right here, and I have my, both of my thumbs are pointing at me. I was. I think he's amazing. I think that he is, and it's actually really funny because the first time I saw Moreno Moser race, I said, Moreno Moser is the second coming of Peter Sagan, and nobody even knew who Sagan was then. I... I'm telling you, I've I've been following this dude for a long time, and he's I, he's an amazing writer. Yes, of course he is, and I respect him when it comes to that. But he's just a douche. He's just a the willies, and oh god, I don't even want to. Uh, don't get me started. Anyway, anyway, who? One thing happened to me while I was watching Gen Bevel game, though, that I think I might as well just bring up. This is not a fully cooked thought, but then again, my. Head usually is a very low temperature, so nothing ever gets cooked before it comes out of my mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, thanks for agreeing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think I don't like Gent Vevelgem. I think this race kind of uh, irks me because it's in a Sunday and it's 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 surrounded by awesome races, and it just kind of never is never amazing am i am i totally wrong no no i mean i think it's it's certainly a lesser race and if you look at past winners the memorable ones for me are the races where there was really bad weather weather like luca paulini Paulini, yeah i mean luca paulini when it's just yeah that's but, just absolutely but aside awesome. from that yeah i mean it's just they're not super memorable I think a lot of people in the United States know it as the race that George Hincapie won. The, the, the one race that he won, yeah. I mean, you know, because it was like, no, but he's made for those races. And he, he got that. And he won it in an interesting way. And they were filming a documentary that year. So it's like memorable in that way. But it's certainly one of the lesser ones. And it also suffers from the fact that it's surrounded by really good races. Much, much, much stronger. Yeah cooler races yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. so of course well I, I think that we would be doing the world a disservice if we didn't mention the death of this uh, kid um, Demonie, Demonitier or whatever his name was what a bitch I debated whether or not I mean I was going to bring it up of course because it's terrible and it's a super bummer and also the fact that somebody another dude died in uh, the Criterium International that's I mean, even though that one wasn't an accident, that of a heart attack, whatever. But 
I debated whether or not I wanted to like kind of discuss this at all. Um, so I'm just gonna leave it up to you, Klaus. If you if you have anything specific to say about this whole. Honestly, and I know we've joked about what I'm about to say before, which is that we don't know anything about anything, and yet we still talk and have opinions about everything. But this one... Which makes it really this, fun. Yeah, right? But with this, I mean, it's, it's so serious. Like, I, I don't know that we have a very different opinion than anyone else. Like, however this can be fixed, I don't know what the solution is. I hope it is, because clearly it's super serious and... It's just horrible and super sad. I mean, I, I don't know what I can... Yeah, I don't know what we can say. I think it was... Uh, was it Cookson that said something? And I and actually, now that I think about it, I don't know if this quote even relates to the to the event, but somebody, and I think it is Cookson, said, um, com- complex problems require complex solutions. Yeah, sure, whatever. But I heard the 32 motorcycles were involved in the race and is it really necessary for 32 motorcycles to and in the three days of the pane there was uh, an, an incident as well with a car almost hitting somebody and then the person got thrown out of the race and i mean again someone that knows would be like you idiot they absolutely must be there i don't know you know for people you know if if you've seen a, a race like that in europe it's astonishing how many there are but i so it seems that way to me, but I don't know why everyone's there. I don't know if it's absolutely necessary. Yeah, so. I mean, I would love for the race organizers. And then the other thing that people have to have in mind is this is not the UCI. Obviously, this is the race organizers. The, the UCI doesn't have any parameters on to, like, what kind of vehicles and whatever. They leave that up to the, to the race organizers because they know better. So, or should know better. Whichever way, the UCI can potentially start telling race organizers you can only have this many, this many, this many. But I would love to see a list specifically of Gen Vevelgem. The 32 motorcycles that were there, what were they there for? What motorcycle was in there? How many people were in there and who were they? It's a professional driver and a photographer, a professional driver and a cameraman, a professional driver and whatever. I would like I would love to be able to see that and where in the race are they supposed to be because that's the other thing that I think is just crazy is how many times you see motorcycles passing the the, the guys and then you see them in the in the side of the road pa- waiting back and I'm sure I mean a lot of those are probably photographers because I know how that works but then how many photographers do you allow in a race how many photographers do we really need oh but the coverage of cycling is bad enough as it is Yes, okay, do we really need 15 different photographers? How about we make it four? Uh, I mean, whatever, yeah, again. I'm sure that's what's going to be reviewed because I, I, mean, I have no idea. But like yeah. I said, I mean, when something so awful happens, I mean, I just hope that if there's a solution, it can happen quickly because, yeah, it's insane. It's also pretty insane that none of the, the, the writers have, well, I, I don't know, maybe for Flanders, they'll be like, after like 20K, they'll just stop and be like, this is our way of protesting the fact that this kid died because there was too many motorcycles. It's, it's a freak accident. Of course it is. And it's actually a miracle that it doesn't happen more often if you really think about it. I mean, I will say this, you know, when the last time that, at least the way I see it, that there was a death that they said this could have been exactly avoided by doing this, was when the helmet started, uh, you know, um, of course, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Walter Whalen and, uh, the Giro. I don't know that you could have pinpointed. I don't know if the helmet thing was accurate, but so I, 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 I'm sure that they will take note and something will come about. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would, I would really hope so. I mean, he's 25 years old, man. I mean, 25 years old. I don't even remember when I was 25. Mostly because I was drunk for 10 years after that. But <laughs> uh, he was born in 1990. So how old does that make him? 26, right? I don't even want to think about it. Yeah. It's a bummer. Uh, no, I don't know. I, the jury's still out on me whether or not I like Van Ve- Vevel game or not. I, but I remember last year thinking something similar. But maybe it's because it was just on the heels of the Luca Paulini, which was awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm not... I'm not really sure. I don't really, not sure. 
So, game, Vevel game then brings us right back to, actually, I don't know, the three days of the planet, you want to talk about that? There's one thing that I want to talk about with that. Yeah. Race that was really funny. So, <laughs> on stage one, uh, oh, I don't know, it, Volta Catalunya. Let's talk about Volta Catalunya first. Uh, Nairo Quintana won that. Contador was second. Daniel Martin was third. Daniel Martin was the defending champ from, from last year. Um, one of the things that I found about the Volta that was just unbelievable this year is who was there. Jesus. Quintana, yeah, Contador, Martin, Porte, uh, Reggie Port, I'm sorry, uh, Froome, uh, Joaquin Rodriguez, Rigo Berturan, uh, Pozzo Vivo, Aru, just everybody in the world yeah. that does like Grand Tour, everybody was there. Yeah, I guess, I mean, there was a couple of exceptions, but it was clearly an insane group. And then, of course, you realize you, or at least you kind of start to wonder, is Quintana peaking a little too early? Is he going to try to dial it back? Or is everyone kind of on par? Just And he was just a tiny bit better than everyone else, but he's not exactly peaking, which maybe is what happened because he wasn't insanely dominant. No, 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 no. He definitely wasn't. But this is a race that is difficult to be insanely dominant in because it's mostly flat stages with a with medium mountain stages and then one big mountain stage that basically whoever wins that stage kind of has to race. So it, it was it was good to see Quintana in, in really good shape. At no point did I see him be weak. Contador on the other hand was not did not look very good. Um it's funny because there was like I don't know whatever, 180 guys he finishes second. I'm saying he was kinda weak. And he was stronger than 178 other dudes. Yeah, I don't know. I thought he looked pretty good. I, really? he, I mean, I, I didn't. No, I don't mean in general, like pretty weak. But there was a couple of attacks that, that Quintana put that Contador just could not. And there was one where Richie Port went for it, and Contador did not could not respond with his usual like quick. You know what I'm saying? Like there but is. See, a, I don't know. Is that age and this year, or is he just not in top form? Because when you compare him to Chris Froome, like Chris Froome wasn't even there for those attacks. Like. Well, yeah, but I think he's, yeah, yeah, you're right. He, I mean, yeah, I don't know what part of his, of his, uh, of his training he's, he's in at this point, at what point, he, or, in, and then as opposed to Froome or, or whatever, but uh, loved Ilnur Sakharin. His race was amazing, spotless. I, I love it. I really hope that we get to hear a lot more from this guy. Number one, because he's amazing. Number two, because his name is Ilnur, and I just love that. It sounds like a name from an alien. Like, if there's, like, a sci-fi movie where the aliens come down and they're like, take me to your leader. My name That's is... the leader? My name is Ilnur. <laughs> just, I don't know. I just love that name. Yeah. So, I really hope that... Uh, Rigoberto Duran looked okay. Um, I know yeah. I, I heard a couple of interviews with him, two interviews actually during the race that he said he wasn't really feeling at 100%. He wasn't going to attack. He wasn't ready. That's not what he was here for or whatever. So, but he was hanging in there pretty good. Yeah, he was. He, he definitely was. And again, we don't know what his target is. Uh, as far as where you know where where he is on his training, um, Domenico yeah. Pozzo Vivo was also a little bit of a of a disappointment. But I don't know what his whole idea was was there. It probably to like help out remember uh, remember. Yeah, I mean, I guess for the Giro for Rigoberto Duran, this seems it seems about right. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, um, the the one thing for the you know, now you bring the Giro up that I'm thinking about that it's it's kind of a bummer is where um, Esteban Chavez is if he's really going for if he's really going for the Giro uh, I don't he hasn't really been showing me anything this year but no, yeah whatever it, I mean he hasn't been bad or anything but. He definitely has not Just considering last year, it kind of seemed like this was all finally really, really coming together for him. So I hope that's the case for this year. Yeah, and I know, and I know that he had a really bad um, stage, like the, the the queen stage, I think it was. He mm. uh, he lost like twenty minutes. So I know that he he, he just kind of it was one day whatever. Maybe he wanted to talk to Froome. Maybe he wanted to hang out with Froome in the back. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, anything else about the Volta Ciclista Catalunya? I don't think. 
uh, that Monjuic stage I love, even though it's super repetitive and not really all yeah. that exciting, but I just love it because that area of Barcelona is just so nice and just getting to see it, like, it's not nice as in beautiful, even though the Monjuic climb itself is kind of picturesque. But just the fact that I know exactly where they are. Just yeah, just know. recognizing things yeah, makes exactly. it kind exactly. of different. Yeah, I really like that. And and to anybody out there, if you haven't been in Barcelona or in Catalonia in general, um, it's unbelievable. It's amazing. I've never, well, I mean, I've ridden a bike there, but I've never really gone riding there. And I'm sure it, it's probably ridiculous. But the city it's of Barcelona. It's very good. The city of Barcelona is unbelievable one of my favorite places in the world and you can always just take a train to Girona take the high speed train and then just go uh, pro scouting and just sit around and look at watch the pros yeah, yeah it's like train, so many. yeah it's uh, pro spotting is that what you said yeah 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 pro spotting yeah, yeah. scouting I called it yeah but that's wrong um, all right so the three days of the pan that's the one where it First stage, the breakaway after they lost the Sky Do or whatever, it ended up being the two. Um, <laughs> just, the, the Astana guys that started the, fighting. The two Astana guys and and, and Alexander Kristoff. Not since the two Schlex. No, were. no, no. Actually, the two Schlex set the tone, and then Ethics Quickstep <laughs> repeated that oh, maybe yeah. four or five times since. And Astana took a page from Ethics, and they were like, dude, there's two of us, there's two of us, let's lose this race. But then, Louis Westra was like, no, we gotta do, we gotta do one better. Instead of just losing, let's fight and yell at each other. In what language they did that in, I would love to know. If I were friends with Christoph, my text would have been like, Hey, dude, what language were they fighting in? Oh, by the way, congratulations. <laughs> because yeah, I just want to know. Was, that was ridiculous. Not, I mean, to lose a race when it's two to one, we now know is easy to do because we've seen it so many times, even though it seems ridiculous to someone that doesn't race like me. But the way they did it was just preposterous. They threw, they threw that away. I think they would have been better served getting caught. If they would have just like, Fight, fought and fought and fought to the point where the bunch caught them because they weren't working together. I think that would have worked out better for them because then it wouldn't been it wouldn't have been the guy that they were with that won. The but race. someone else, it wouldn't have been so obvious that they blew it. Exactly, exactly, absolutely hilarious, ridiculous. Also, it doesn't help that Louis Westra and um, Luchenko are like complete opposites. In the, you're like, are you guys even in the same race? Like one of them is like super tall and lanky and the other one looks like a friggin' like Russian mobster. It's just hilarious. It's just, it was just so perfect and so funny. And the only thing that could have made that better is if they would have gotten off their bikes and just started punching each other. Which that, maybe did in the bus. Yeah. No, actually, I think somebody else punched them both in the face when they got I hope. I hope yeah. Vino punched them both. Yeah, I think it's funny though too that you know Christoph is probably like, and then he hears something and they're yelling. And again, it depends on which language they're yelling at. And I'm gonna say it's probably English. I don't know if Luchenko speaks Dutch or Flemish or Vesper speaks Italian. But anything that freaking. sounded agitated or I, exactly, it doesn't matter if you don't understand a it word. Can't be. How could yeah. you be? Christoph is like looking back, like I just won this race. These idiots are like fighting. <laughs> this is awesome. I know. He didn't know that he was up against two of the three Stooges. <laughs> uh, which, which one's the of the three Stooges? Which one's the one that is like smart, quote unquote? Oh, I don't even know. I just make references to them. Yeah, me too. But he's not curly or whatever. No. Yeah, whatever. The, the guy that is kind of smart, that's Vino. He was in the, he was in the bus. No, I yeah, know yeah. that Vino was probably not even there. But that set the tone for an awesome, awesome, awesome finale. It was just, I, he, he wasn't even close when he, like, when Christoph was, like, first for the, for the sprint, I was like, why is he first? Is he nuts? Why is he, he's, they're going to go around him. And then I was like, oh, wait, there's no freaking way they're gonna go around him he just like sprinted <laughs> he just like it wasn't even close awesome Amazing. i absolutely loved it and was that the stage where somebody threw a punch 
Oh, I didn't know about that. Or was that today? Did you watch the stage today? I have not. So maybe that was today. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So yeah, it was a, it was a somebody threw a punch. I can't remember who it was. Uh, and uh, I was waiting to hear if there was going to be any repercussions or whatever. But let me see if. Um, But anyway, uh, the, the stage today was good too, and I think my but my tweet about today's stage was way better than the stage itself. You know, Elia, Elia, Elia Viviani won the stage, right? And he, oh, yeah, I did see that. Yeah, 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 yeah. He celebrated, man, like like a sore throat. It must have like. Yeah, it took a really long time. He was like the happiest person in the world, <laughs> and my tweet was something like Viviani went like, yeah, but then he went like. Oh, I still don't have a gold medal in the Omnium. <laughs> oh, come on. No, but, um, yeah, I think, uh, 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 what's his name from Eurosport, was sort of saying that Sky was going too early and this was a complete waste of time. Like, And then, of course, Viviani won. Oh, I didn't know that. But, yeah. Uh, you know what I hear, you want to hear what's interesting, though, is that um, the Viviani Omnium thing gets mentioned a lot. And as I'm looking here to see who it was that threw the punch, and mm. I just found it, I just saw it's like the victory is as important, uh, it's an important one for Viviani, who was unable to defend his Omnium world title on the track earlier this month. <laughs> They keep bringing it up. And now I'm going to tell you something. I'm not a track guy, but I understand the track is a big deal. This is the world championship track, gold Omnium. It's a big deal, right? You're comparing yeah, that to winning? It's never brought up about anyone else. What's that? It hardly ever gets brought up against about anyone else. I mean, yeah. sometimes it's got media and stuff like that. But exactly. Like Mark Cavendish or but something. what I'm saying, though, is it's a big deal. And you're, you're yeah. saying that it's as important as a stage win in the three days of the panic? Really? That's it? Yeah, 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 you're right. I want to go through the list of people that have won stages in this race and compare it to the list of people who have won gold in the Omnium and then see who's... I mean, come on! Anyway, yeah. I just, I just oh, think it's funny. Know, I feel I, bad for him because he the only reason he keeps coming up is because he made such a big deal out of it. He cried like such a little baby about it that everybody now is aware that he was upset. If he would have just kept so, his mouth shut, then nobody would have cared. Nobody's yeah. talking about the guys that like lost the team pursuit or whatever. I don't know. Some other track thing that I don't know about. But anyway, so the guy who um, won is, uh, in, I actually say, Fistikov's Katusha rider landed a light punch on a direct energy rider. But it, that's all it said. So I guess nobody got thrown out yeah, of the because race. It's, because it's direct energy, no one nobody really probably knows what it is. Wait, who did he throw a punch to? Direct energy. Are they in this race? Yeah. Oh. Then it doesn't really. If we throw them out, then he's going to bring attention to the fact that... Uh, Said that they're in this But race, so let's not do anything. Okay, so before we go, we have, of course, the Tour of Flanders this weekend. Uh, and I have three questions for you, Klaus. Yes. Who do you think is going to win? Uh, Cancellara? Hmm, okay. Now, who do you want to win? Tambonin? <laughs> I'm stuck in like four years ago. Uh, <laughs> it would be cool if Tambonin won, though. What's that? Oh, it, it would be, be cool if Tambonin oh, won. Oh, hell yeah, it would be awesome. Uh, okay, so you have Cancellara as the winner with your head. Bonin, your heart. And then the third question is, where are you going to watch the race? Uh, probably just by myself. Well, well... Yeah, probably. Just I mean, there's home. a place where I could go watch it, but I probably just like alone. I don't know. So you're gonna watch it alone in your home, okay? Oh, actually, one more question: What do you think are the odds that Tyler Farah wins the uh, Tour of Flanders on Sunday? This is according to uh, the yeah. website that I sometimes like, look at odds for. I never gamble because that's illegal. I, like. One in 500? No! One in 250, Klaus. Oh. I'm sorry. I am sorry. Okay. So, now I can tell you that for me, I think... Oh, and I can tell you that Cancellara is 3 to 1. Has the highest odds or the mm -hmm. best odds. 
Um, and Tom Bonin are th- is thirty three to one. So okay, that's not terrible. I mean, terrible. he's aging and probably can't even ride a bike very well, but it would be <laughs> awesome. I can tell you that for me, my head and my heart both say, both say Cancellara, uh, and I'm gonna watch it here at home as well. Actually, oh no, shoot. I'm not going to watch it here at home. I'm going to a friend's house for a breakfast. See, the bug spreads. We came up mm. with the idea for these, for these like, uh, Belgian breakfasts, and now more people are doing them. And then also, this Sunday is opening day for the Pittsburgh Pirates. The first time that it's in a Sunday in, like, forever. And it's supposed to be really nice weather. So, breakfast Flanders with some alcoholic beverages... And then, from there, walk to the stadium, more alcoholic beverages. Go into the stadium, more alcoholic beverages, until you get thrown out, you get home, and then you sleep it off. With more alcoholic beverages. <laughs> you just you hug an alcoholic beverage and fall asleep with it. Okay. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Klaus. I appreciate you joining us. Uh, Mike, you missed out on all kinds of fun. Enjoy the Tour of Flanders, everybody. But before you do, there's one thing that is very important that you need to know about the Tour of Flanders before you... Drink responsibly? Well, drink responsibly. No. Where, where does the Tour of Flanders actually start? Please tell us. I, I don't know. I'm no expert, but I know an expert, and his name is Paul Sherwin. Paul Sherwin, where does the Tour of Flanders start? We're out of here. Peace. Heading up towards Paul's favorite climb, the old Quadamont. And I've always felt that the real start of the Tour of Flanders is at the old Quaremont. You plunge off the Knochterberg, and it's the start of what I've always regarded as being the first real strategic point of this bike race, the Eau de Quaremont. But for me, and I've always said it, I say it every year, the race really begins at the old Quaremont. The old Quaremont is regarded by all of the teams, all of the team managers, as the strategic point number one. This is where the bike race really starts. To me, the race has always really started at the old Quaremont. But I've always regarded the big start of the Tour of Flanders as being the old Quaremont. For me, it all starts at the old Quaremont, which is the fifth climb of the day. Everybody knows that at the old Quaremont, that's the, that's the climb that you can lose the Tour of Flanders on. And he actually said this morning before the start that as far as he's concerned, the Ronde van Vlaanderen starts at the old Quaremont. The race always begins for me traditionally when the riders hit the old Quaremont. The crowds here turning out for the, uh, the old Quaremont. Everybody knows this is a famous climb. This is where the Tour of Flanders always starts to hot up. I've always felt that the start and the real start of the Tour of Flanders and the action becomes uh, happens at the Eau de Quaremont. Around about 10 kilometers to go to the old Quaremont. And that's always, to me, been the real start of the aggression in this race, the Tour of Flanders. But of course, to me, it all starts at the old Quaremont. The race really begins at the old Quaremont. The old Quaremont is regarded by all of the teams, all of the team managers, as the strategic point number one. This is where the bike race really starts.